Well, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Emily Skates. I'm on the pastoral team here at Helen Park Prez. And it's such a joy to be here with you this morning to preach God's word. And if you have your Bible or the Mark journal that we have for you, we're going to be looking at Mark 4, verses 26 to 29. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Mark 4, verses 26 to 29. And I want you to hold it open with me as we go through this text. Because here's the thing. This text is a parable. It is Jesus teaching and he uses a parable, which, which really is like Jesus lining up a picture that we can see to describe something we cannot see. It's his way of describing the indescribable. It's his way of painting a picture of the unseen to stretch our imaginations so that we can catch a glimmer of the unimaginable light stuff, right? And so I want you to see, because what Jesus is doing here in this text is he's casting a vision for us about none other than the kingdom of God. And now a few weeks ago, Andrew Franklin preached on the kingdom of God, and he reminded us that the kingdom of God is wherever the will of God is being carried out. Jeremy Treat, a writer for the Gospel Coalition, he described the kingdom of God as God's reign through God's people over God's place. Now remember, the kingdom of God is indescribable. It's unimaginable. It's something that we can't truly take hold of. It's like if you try to pin it down, it's like trying to pin down a cloud. It's going to vanish. And so Jesus gives us this picture of the kingdom of God. And it's right here in these four verses. But let me go ahead and pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word, would you come and speak to each one of us? Would you remind us of who you are and what you have done and what you are doing and what you will do, Lord? And would that speak to who we are and remind us of our calling, of what does it mean to be in the kingdom of God and to be joining you? So, Lord, I ask that you just come and do what only you can do. I ask that you come and speak to us this morning, Lord, and use me as just a vessel so that we can hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Mark 4, starting at verse 26, here is Jesus casting his vision of the kingdom of God. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts, and it grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, Jesus is talking to a crowd of people here. Like us, they, or unlike us, they don't have the words sitting out in front of them. They're listening to Jesus as he's describing this picture, as he's describing this kingdom of God. And right before this, these people, they're expecting Jesus to tell them about how to join the kingdom of God. For in chapter 3, at the end, Jesus reminds them, whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. He's saying, whoever does the will of God, you are a part of my family. When you join me in ushering my kingdom, you are a part of that kingdom. You are mine. And so he's probably surrounded by these 
people, probably a lot like us, you know, ready to roll up our sleeves, ready to get the job done. Like, okay, Jesus, tell me what to do. I'm ready. Here we go. But then Jesus is giving them this picture, and most likely it's shocking. For you see, a lot of these men and women, maybe they're working as farmers or they're in agriculture, so they understand a lot about farming and seed and planting. And what they notice right off the bat probably is, well, first of all, there's this man and he's just scattering seed. They probably think, does this man, is he even a farmer? Does he know what he's doing? Does he even know what a seed is? I mean, come on, isn't he going to plow the ground? Isn't he going to at least dig so that the seed can go into the soil? Isn't he going to check the weather to know when to plant the seeds? I mean, I've been learning recently about how to plant, and I have to tell you, I've learned the hard way that you don't plant in the middle of summer. (laughs) You wait till the fall. You got to know these things. You got to plan. And here, what Jesus is describing is, hey, there's this man, and he's just scattering seed. No plan, nothing going on. He's just out scattering seed, letting it loose. And then to make matters worse, he goes home and sleeps. No going back out watering the ground. No going back out pruning it. No going back out and probably I would pick up the seed and do it all over again. So these people were probably thinking, what on earth is Jesus talking about? What is going on here? Well, what Jesus is portraying is, hey, you should be shocked. The kingdom of God is not the kingdom of man. The way of God is not the way of man. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And so, of course, we're going to be shocked. We're going to be confused. And as Jesus goes on, this man who's just scattering seed, doesn't know how to farm, doesn't really know what he's doing, and yet the seed sprouts, The seed grows, it produces this blade and then the ear and then the full grain in the ear and it actually becomes ripe. Despite the lack of skill and knowledge and ability to farm, it's working. There's something working and maybe, just maybe, It's not at all really about the man. It's more about the seed. To truly grasp this parable is not to roll up our sleeves and say, how do I do this? How do I get it done? How do I control? How do I be the best? How do I be the most effective? Rather, it's how do I get that seed? What is in that seed? There's something going on here, and I think the key to understand the kingdom of God, the key to understand the picture that God is painting for us is to understand the seed. You know, I I was thinking about this, and last week Brian got to preach on the parable of the seed and the sower, and, and I was a little bit jealous because, you know, it goes through the parable, and then at the end it talks about how Jesus describes every little detail of that parable, we don't have that here. (laughs) Y'all are stuck with me. And so I was thinking, well, you know, thanks, Brian. Yeah, if y'all think of something to get him back, just let me know. I think all of you should go out tonight just dressed up as Brian for Halloween and all go knock on his door and say, I'm here, give me your food. But I was thinking, what what is this seed? What could it be? Could it be the Holy Spirit? Well, I don't know, because it talks about the man scattering it. It talks about the man kind of controlling it, holding it in his hands. No, I mean, can we really control the Holy Spirit? 
So I was saying, it can't be the Spirit. Is it maybe the man throwing out blessing? Just, I bless you. I bless you in the name of Christ. I bless you health. I bless you this and that. I don't know because it seems like something more tangible, something more you can hold and, and give away. And it, it remains. It stays there. I was thinking, is it Jesus scattering us out into the world maybe? But then why would it say that the seeds grow and this man has no idea how it's happening? Jesus would know how it's happening, right? He is God incarnate, so he would know. So it can't be the Holy Spirit or blessing or Jesus scattering us. It's got to be meaty. It's got to be tangible. It's got to be something we can put in our hands. And yet at the same time, it's got to be powerful. It's got to be pregnant, full of life. There's got to be mystery. What has all of that? Well, if we go to the parable that Brian preached last Sunday where Jesus so kindly explained everything, he tells us that the sower or the farmer sows the word of God. What is tangible? What is meaty? What can be in our hands and scattered, and be growing, and powerful, and mighty? None other than the Word of God. The key to knowing this parable is really, what do you believe about the Word of God? What do you believe about this seed? You know, today in our world, I think... We're getting it mixed up. You know, today is a day where we're, it, we celebrate the Reformation. The Reformation of this time where it's all about getting back to God's Word. It's about getting back to the truth. And they came up with this saying afterwards that's been continued throughout, throughout by Reformed churches and Reformed Presbyterians. And that word is... Reformed, always reforming according to the word of God. You know, if we think about, look back at the Reformation, a lot of us think it was Martin Luther. Yeah, Martin Luther had some great ideas. But where did it come from? The word of God. But what if I told you Luther wasn't even about getting it out to us. In fact, Luther, he wrote the 95 Theses in Latin. This was just for the scholars. This was just for the very educated, smart people. He, he was a little bit disturbed that it got out. What really ignited the Reformation was not Martin Luther. It was Johannes Gutenberg, the inventor of the printing press. And he translated the Bible into German, and guess what? It got out. The Reformation spread. There was revival. Why? Because the Word got back into the hands of the people of God. It changed them. It reformed them. It shaped them. And they surrendered to it. And they're saying, so we always surrender. We keep surrendering according to the Word of God. But sadly, churches today, there's a lot of, yeah, I'm reformed. Yeah, I'm reforming. But they're leaving out according to the word of God. That's dangerous. And I have to think about why is that is? Well, well if you look around, usually it's because, well, this, this black and white pages, boring, just nothing but words, and it's long, it's archaic. Look around, that's a lot of what our culture believes. They look at this book and think of it as just old, boring, irrelevant material. Our world has lost the wonder and awe of God's word. And therefore, churches are reformed, always reforming. But to what? 
The Reformation is all about getting back to the Word of God. And when we know what that is, we will truly live out this kingdom mission that Jesus is talking about. And it's not going to be some word where we think we need to prop it up, where we need to add fluff and make it look cool and make it sound trendy and make it sound powerful. It's not something where we have to add all this humor or all this narratives or extra stuff, even though that's not bad, but really the power comes from the word of God. Here's what God tells us about his word. 1 Timothy, Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God. And it's profitable, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What does God say about his word? What does he say about this book that just looks so normal? so archaic, so bland sometimes. He says, open it up, and it's my word to you. It's the word from God himself. You open it up and you're having a conversation with God. It is God who counsels our life. It is God who shows us the way, the truth, and the direction we need to go. It is his voice. It is his counsel when we open up his word. Do we believe that? Do we believe that this is truly God speaking to us? Which means it's not irrelevant. When people will tell me, Emily, the Bible is just irrelevant. It has nothing to do with me. I tritely kind of remind them, mm, maybe you're not relevant to the Bible. Because the Bible is relevant. It's about God, and God is always relevant. It is his word to us. So don't we want to get into his word? But not only that, it's not just a conversation between us and God. There's more going on. There's more than we even can imagine or realize. And we're told in Hebrews 4 verses 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word it's not just a conversation. It is God actually present with us, doing things in our hearts, in the unseen, in the unknown. I mean, how do you pierce joints and marrow? He enters into the deepest part of us. He knows more than we know about ourselves, and he meets us down in the depths, down in the soil down in the places where we want to even dare go. Open up the word of God and the surgeon comes and pierces our heart. He comes in and does his greatest work. He goes where no one, no one else can. He sees what no one else can see. And he ministers to the very place we need whenever we enter into his word. Do we believe this? Do we believe this when we open up God's word? Because that's the key. If we don't believe this, well, we're not going to really care about scattering God's seed. It's not going to be exciting to go get it out to people because guess what? It's not really exciting to us. It's not going to be something that, that is needed because we don't see how it's needed in our lives. We don't see how it's going to be needed in other people's lives. So we just tuck it away. 
But when we do believe all this about the word of God, what happens? We scatter the seed. We get it out. We get it out to people because it's the most important thing in the world. I mean, if you could meet God Almighty, if you could take someone that you love and place them in the seat where God comes and meets them, wouldn't you do it? You can do that by placing them in the word of God where he meets them. There's so many different ways that we can scatter God's word. We can write it in our letters. I talked with someone just the other week, and she said that her grandmother always ended her letters with scripture. And ever since her grandmother has passed, she has every single one of those cards. And it's empowered her because her grandmother scattered the seed. But not only that, it's given her great hope and joy when her grandmother passed. Because the fact that her grandmother scattered the seed meant her grandmother was in the seed. And so she knew where her grandmother was and it gave her hope. We can scatter the seed through text messages as we are praying prayers over to one another, as we are encouraging one another. You can wrap scripture up in a piece of paper and put it in your kids' lunchboxes. There's so many different ways that we can scatter the seed that we can let it loose, that we can let it go. That is why Jesus isn't so particular. You scatter the seed because as long as the seed gets out, guess what? It's going to get loose. No matter how you do it, no matter what way you do it. But then you also want to join God in bringing his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. You scatter the seed and then you sleep on it. Where else can you be told that you have this huge project, this huge duty, and they say, you know what, just sleep on it. It'll happen. This is the only place in God's kingdom that we can sleep on it. And no, it's not talking about being lazy. It's not talking about scattering the seed and forgetting about it. Rather, sleeping on it was actually an act of faith. And then I'm going to scatter the seed. I'm going to let it loose. And I'm going to believe that the power inside that seed is going to take place. That it's going to grow. That I don't need to control it. I'm not the one in charge. Rather, there is someone else in charge. You know, before I come and preach, I always have these Bible verses with me because it helps me sleep at night. Because <laughs> I think, I've, okay, I've done the preparation, I've written my sermon, and now it's time to sleep, because you know what? God's gonna do the rest, right? Although I have to tell you, I did not sleep last night, so I don't know what that's about. <laughs> um, God's teaching me a hard lesson, doing something. But the first one is 1 Thessalonians 1 verse five, where Paul writes, for we know, brothers, sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. It wasn't on Paul to convert them. No, he scattered the seed and he knew that the power of God was at work in that seed. But then I love also 2 Corinthians 3, verse 4 through 6. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. I stand up here before you not because I'm competent, not because I'm powerful, not because I have it figured out. I stand up here before you because I know that the word of God is competent. Not in itself. The word of God is not just a means of an end into itself. Rather, it's a means to meet the living God who is powerful. He is active through the word. I am just scattering the seed and he is meeting you in places you might not even realize. I believe that. That's the only reason I'm here. 
It's the only reason I'm not trying to control it. I don't know why I didn't sleep last night. But I know God is here and active. And actually, the Jews, what they would do was when they would sleep, they would pray with expectation. They would actually get excited because when they were sleeping, they actually saw that as the beginning of their day. The beginning of their day was saying, you know what? God, you're in control. I'm not. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to start parallel to the ground because I know you're working. And then they would wake. They would rise up after their sleep. And what would they do? They would pray with thanksgiving because they would know that in the invisible, in the unseen, God was at work in their lives, in the world. And so this sleeping and rising, it's actually a faithfulness. It's a trust that, yeah, they're called to go and do ministry, but they can sleep on it because they're not doing it alone. God's at work. God is doing it. We are just joining him, and it's ongoing It's ongoing. When we do this, when we live into this faithfulness of scattering the seed and going to sleep and waking, sleep and waking, expecting God to be at work, expecting God to do his thing, it's going to give us this hope, this confidence, this excitement. When God says, who shall we send? You'll say, here I am. Send me. It's this trust in God, but it's also this humility. This is what I love here, that Jesus really hones in that, you know what, we don't know a single thing. As we look in verse 27, we see the man is sleeping and rising, and the seed sprouts and grows, but he knows not how says it sprouts, he doesn't know how. It grows, he doesn't know how. But as if to rub it in, as if we didn't get it yet, that it's not us, it's God. Verse 28 starts with automatos. What does that sound like? Automatic, autonomy, by itself. The English says the earth produces by itself, but in the Greek it's actually by itself. The earth produces. Here, Jesus is emphasizing it's not us, but God. So when you're wanting to grow in your own sanctification, are you striving? When you're desiring for your your child or your grandchild to come to the faith, are are you trying to control it and get it in yourself? When it comes to wanting ministry or the church to flourish, are are we striving and putting all the pressure on ourselves or are we getting a good sleep at night? Because sleep means we are trusting God. And when we trust, that's when we will begin to see. We'll begin to see the blade that maybe that friend that you have who hasn't been so sure about God, maybe they're actually saying, can I come with you to church? Maybe you're seeing even bigger things now. You're, you're starting to see the ear that maybe that person is like, I'm really excited about reading the Bible. I, I really want to pray. Maybe you're starting to see that over time now that that blade that's turned into an ear has become full grain in the ear that has matured, that maybe they're not just taking in the word of God, but they're too scattering the word of God. They too are teaching it and sharing it and wanting to get it out. And here's the thing. When we see that, we cannot take credit because we don't know how. It's just by grace that we get to be a part of it. 
And so it ends with humility. When we realize that the seed is the word of God, that we just scatter it, it has nothing to do with us. And the word of God is so powerful that it grows on its own. God doesn't need us, but he lets us join us. That is when we get verse 29 because we are so humbled. It takes us to the ultimate landing place. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, if we're thinking it's on us, we're going to think that we're the man here putting in the sickle. Hey, you know what? Maybe he wasn't a good farmer at the beginning, but somehow he knows how to grab the harvest. He knows how to watch till it's ready. He knows when it's ripe. All of a sudden, he got these farming skills. No, when we understand that the word of God is powerful, we are not. We realize by the end, verse 29 is not about us anymore. The sickle isn't ours. No, we're the harvest. Because as we try to join God in his kingdom, in his ministry, he's also growing us. The Greek word for ripe is paradidomi. Paradidomi. Which truly means it's a fruit that is surrendered. It's a fruit that's offering itself. It's a fruit that's giving itself up. It's a fruit that is delivering itself up. And that's the harvest we will see one day. It is unimaginable. But imagine when the entire kingdom of God is ripe, is ready. We all will be so surrendered, so sanctified, so perfect, a place that God Almighty is pleased to dwell. And when that happens, Jesus will come with his sickle and he will harvest us. And I don't know about you, but I look at my life and I think, whew, I've got a long way to go. Hopefully, you know, I have some more time. Is it on me? I can start to get anxious. Am I ready for the harvest? Am I going to be a part of the harvest? Look at my life. Can I really say that I'm going to be this harvest? But then we've got to remember, it's not us. It's Christ. And what Christ began on the cross for us, Paul reminds us in Philippians, that he will bring it to completion. Just get in the word. Let it scatter in your heart. Let it scatter to those around you, but not just a few times, but daily, continually, faithfully. And then you'll see God is at work. And you can truly surrender. You can truly give yourself to the word of God because he came and manifested himself. He became flesh and he surrendered himself. He offered himself so that the power would be unleashed and we can join him by grace and grace alone. And so may we be a church where we continually are reformed, always reforming, according to the word of God. Let us pray. God, if we sit here like that farmer, wanting to join you, you're, you're calling us, and you've given us your word, and so Lord, teach us how to scatter and sleep. Teach us what it means to truly trust in you. And Lord, would you comfort us when we can't see it, when we can't touch it, when we don't feel it, that you are working in us and in the world. Lord, would you remind us that even though we can't see, we can trust, we can know. Because we know that you're a God who has begun the good work on the cross. And you are coming again. 
with the sickle that will harvest us all, ready, prepared for your kingdom, not because of our work, but because you are the one who completes the work that you have begun. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.